Okay, hello everyone. Welcome to our last Parsha Insights of the season before we'll take a break uh, for a month and change for the, uh, for the summer. And we are up to Parsha Korach, which is a very exciting Parsha. And uh, like, like uh, most Parsha Yoder, as we've experienced in the last while, we can get stuck on even the first word of the Parsha and, and, and dive down. And the Parsha opens with Korach and his co-conspirators, Datan and Aviram, and, and there's another one named On Ben Pellet, and they plan a rebellion against Moshe, and they are punished. And instead of focusing on the nature of the rebellion itself, we, I just wanted to, uh, to bring to life one point or one aspect of the story, which I hadn't really looked at in any depth before, and that was um, that was what, what happened after the aftermath of, of, the, pun, of, the, uh, of the sin, because they are uh, punished, and they're punished in a very severe way. So let's take a look uh, at uh, the 16th chapter in verse, starting in verse uh, 27. And, uh, you know, they basically have this, um, uh, they have this competition almost between the prophets and, and, and with the, the incense plates and the fire pan, um, and uh, and God responds, and God responds by clearly favoring uh, favoring Moshe, and God says to Moses, you know, get up from around them, from all around the dwelling places of Korach, Datan, and Aviram, and uh, and God speaks to the assembly right before this uh, these verses, the verse before God spoke to the assembly and said, turn away now from near the tents of these wicked men, and don't touch anything of theirs, lest you perish because of all their sins. And now the people, now, now the people, uh, starting in verse 27, we're going to jump in with this. So the people then withdrew from about the abodes of Korach, Datan, and Aviram. And now Datan and Aviram had come out, and they stood at the entrance of their tents with their wives, their children, and their little ones. Okay, so Neshem v'neim v'tapam. Vayomer Moshe, and Moses said, Bazot tedum ki Adonai shalachani la'asot kol ma'asim ha'ele ki lo milibi. By this you shall know, if these men die as all men do, it's their lot to be the common fate of all mankind. It was not the Lord who sent me. But if something unusual happens, meaning if they die a natural death, okay, you know that they were, that they, there was nothing wrong with these people, that they, did, they didn't do anything, uh, anything particular wrong. However, if the Lord, verse 30, if the Lord brings about something unheard of, so that the ground opens its mouth and swallows them up with all that belongs to men, to, to them, and they go down alive into Sha'ol, into, I mean, Sha'ol is translated here as Sha'ol, but we understand it's the depths, it's a place that one doesn't want to go, then you know that these men have spurned the Lord, and he uh, scarcely had he finished, the ground under them Opened up, Asher Adam Asher Tachnem. The ground opened them, opened up, Vatiptach Haaretz at Piha, and the earth opened up its mouth and swallowed them up with their households. Ve'Kol Haadam Asher LeKorach, all of Korach's people, Ve'Et Kol Harechush. So they, everyone, right? Datan Aviram, their wives, their children, the, the, and, the, and the little ones, and then all of Korach's people. Kol ha'adam asher le'korach. Okay, so everyone is gestorben. Everybody is dead at this point. All associated with the sin have now perished, and uh, and we're ready to move on to the next story. Sounds good. It's just one problem. That uh, ten chapters later, in the twenty-sixth chapter, in uh, in Parshat Pinchas. In the 26th chapter of, uh, of Bamidbar, the verse, uh, the verse says, I'm just opening up in the Chumash right in front of me as it's taking a census, since the context is, is yet another census in Parsha Pinchas. We're talking about Eliav, the sons of Eliav, we're Nemuel, we're Datan and Aviram, right? This is from the family of Reuven, a Reuveni. They're in this, these are the same, and by the way, if these names look familiar, these are the same people, same Datan and Aviram, chosen in the assembly, who agitated against Moses and Aaron, part of Korach's band, when they agitated against the Lord. If you recognize these names, these were the sinners. Whereupon the earth opened its mouth and swallowed them up with Korach. When that band died, when the fire consumed the 250 men, they became an example. And here comes 
the verse that confuses and confounds and perplexes, Uvenei Korach Lo Mesu. The sons of Korach didn't die. And so the question that you have, the question that I have, the question that the rabbis have and the Midrashim have, what are you talking about? <laughs> Didn't you just tell me 10 chapters earlier that the earth swallowed up all of the people who were, who were, who belonged to Korach, all of Korach's people. And now you're telling me that the children of Korach didn't die. And didn't you tell me about Neshehem, Uvenehem, the Tapam, about the wives and the children and the little ones all out and all part of this assembly? So help me out. I have a contradiction. Any suggestions? How do you resolve a contradiction? Esther? I'm just looking at the, the words all corals. Korah's people, but it doesn't necessarily mean that Korah is part of those people, at the, of the ones that died, I mean. Maybe that's why. So you don't think it, it, okay, so firstly, uh, yeah, there are Midrashim that say that Korah himself survived. just want to point that out, that Korah himself, for a variety of reasons, wasn't killed. Um, but how about his sons? Weren't his sons part of it? Right? Uh, that's the assumption. So you could say, Esther, you're right. You could say that we're, we're catching it on a technicality, that kol ha'adam asher la korach, all of korach's people happens not to include his sons. Right? That's a, it would be an interesting nuance. That would be an interesting what happened? point for the Torah to make, that all of korach's, that korach's sons are not connected to, uh, 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 to the people. That, 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 that's not included in the same group. That's going to be the attempt that, that some of the rabbis that we're going to look at are going to, are going to make and just say, by the way, this phrase that Kol Ha'adam Asher LaKorach doesn't include Korach's sons. Anything else? Any other suggestions? The Talmud is going to get very creative. And the Midrash is going to get very creative. So let's take a look at some of the commentators and we'll take a look at some of the options. Is it uh, possible some of them just survived even though the earth opened up and... Ah, uh, good, 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 good. Okay, excellent. There, there was a consuming flame. Maybe somehow some of them survived the plague. And good. So now now we're, we're getting caught on another, I, I suppose, a technical uh, aspect. And I think this is a great, a great point that the verse never says they died. It only says that the earth swallowed them up. So it could be we're talking about two different things and maybe... Some people can be swallowed up by the earth and not die. Yeah. It, it also says um, all Korach's people. Mm. But that doesn't necessarily imply his sons. I lost my his people could be those that associate with him, but not necessarily his sons. Yeah. yeah but it, yeah. it says B'nai Korach. That's, it's too... It's too direct and black and white yeah yeah so you could also infer from this uh, a separation between the sons and 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 the people and just say that they're not part of maybe they're not part maybe those are two different categories and maybe the sons were not part of the story uh, even though one would assume from so much else in the story and from what we know about these families and how they operate in ancient times that that the sons were part of what the fathers did but maybe we can infer something something differently here. So look at what Bechor Shor. Bechor Shor says, Even though it says, you know, how, why are we saying that Korach's sons didn't die? Even though it says that all the people that belonged to all of Korach's people, that's referring, Hainu, that's referring to Avadav, his servants, Shibchotav, his maidservants, Aval Banav, but his sons, Kfar Hayu Muchlakim Imenu. His sons were... The word muchlakim from the Hebrew word chelak, which means a portion. They were apportioned. They were separated, separated. from him. And they didn't join him in his in his uh, um, in his debates and his fighting against Moshe. And therefore, they didn't lie. I think they didn't die. And I think this is the most straightforward straightforward resolution. Is just to say, yeah, all all of Korach's people didn't include his sons. I think that's the that's the simplest uh, approach in my, to my mind. Is very what is in it, Bachor Shor? What century and who is it? Yosef Bachor Shor. I don't have the century off offhand, but uh, not this one. 
or the previous one. Um, but I will, it, it's, uh, I could look it up in a moment, but it, or, or any of you could. I, I don't have it offhand. Okay. The Chizkuni notes, uh, and the sons of Korach had not died. And even though they were Levites, so when we're talking about in the context of the, of the, the census, another question that we ask is, you know, a census refers this, where it says the sons of Eliab, this is talking about the different families. There's the, you know, Reuven was the firstborn of Israel, the verse says. And the sons of Reuven were Hanoch and Palu and Chetron and, and Karmi. And the son of Palu was Eliav. So Eliav was Reuven's grandson. And the sons of Eliav were Nemuel and Datan Abiram. So we're talking about great grandsons of Reuven. And then why are we saying here the sons of Korach didn't die? What does that have to do with anything? What does that have to do with the price of tea in China? Why is that relevant? We're talking about a census here. This is not a recounting of the story of Korach. And within the census, we go family by family. So we're talking about the family of Reuven. Korach, remember? Remember what family Korach comes from? He comes from the Levites. That's part of his argument against Moshe. Moshe, we're cousins. I'm a Levite also. Why do you have the mantle of leadership and I don't? And so the Chizkuni notes that B'nai Korach Lometu, that the sons of Korach had not died, that even though they were Levites, the Torah refers to them as if they had been part of the wicked tribe of Reuven, the people who had, who had rebelled, rebelled, seeing that the wickedness of, uh, of Reuven uh, was, uh, 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 see, the wickedness of the tribes and the members of Reuven, Datan Abiram, had been greater than that of Korach. Even. Korach's sons, not having joined the rebellion or having repented in time, was therefore even more remarkable. So this is speaking in praise of, uh, of Korach's son. The Chizkuni, of course, is, uh, is the 13th century, um, uh, Chanoch ben Menashe. And the Chizkuni notes, you know, the fact that Korach is being included within the list of Reuven is showing us something about how bad Korach was, because this was really, you know, the, the, the Reuvenites. And why do we say, oh, let me just uh, pause for a moment. Why do we say that of those who participated in the rebellion, the Reuvenites, the people of the tribe of Reuven, and Korach, who is the tribe of Levi. Who is worse? Who is worse? And the answer that many of the rabbis give is, Datan and Aviram, the people who came from the tribe of Reuven, they were worse. Because at least Korach had an argument. At least Korach had a reason. I'm from the tribe of Levi, he said. I should also have... There's logic to that. The, the people from the tribe of Reuven... They were just out for a fight. They were mercenaries. They were out for an argument. They just wanted to come on board for the. I'm reminded of of, of the, uh, you know the the brawls in baseball. You know you have the people, you have the batter who is who is beamed. He has every right to charge the mound, but the bullpen pitcher who comes running in from from the outfield, what, what does he have to do with anything? He's standing up for his team. He's up for a fight. He wants some action. Okay, and that's and that's the tribe of Reuven. Korach, he had the logic. He had a reason to fight. The Reuvenites did not. And so what the Chizkuni says is very interesting. He says, you're mentioning Korach with the Reuven folks to show how evil he was. It shows how low he went to be along with the others. And all the more so, this is remarkable that his children were not part of the part of that plague and his children did not perish. That's remarkable. That's what the Chizkuni says. And finally, Rashi leads us to the Talmud. We've seen, by the way, this is just very logical. It's all of Korach's people did not include his sons. Korach was terrible. His sons repented. Good. That's great. That explains why Korach's sons didn't die. Okay, in, the, in that particular plague. It all makes sense. Rashi, wow. They were in the plot originally, he says, but at the moment when the rebellion broke out, they had thoughts of repentance in their hearts. Okay, good. So they repented. But what happened to them? Therefore, a high spot was fenced round for them in Gehenna, and they stayed there. What? <laughs> Where is this coming from? Why is Rashi telling me this? Why can't, I mean, this is a, whenever we have a Rashi, whenever, 
Rashi offers an opinion that seems to deviate from the simple understanding. What's there's a book written by what's bothering Rashi? Why was Rashi not satisfied with a, an answer sim, sim, that simply says that Korach's people didn't die, does not include his son, or, or died, does not include his sons. His sons didn't die. It, it could be that Rashi on a shot level, on the level of, of understanding, the simple understanding of the Torah, looked at this verse and said that the earth opened its mouth and swallowed them up with all their households, all of Korach's people, all of their possession, that Rashi says that clearly includes their, his sons. For you to tell me that Korach's own family is not included in this phrase of all Korach's people doesn't make sense to Rashi. And therefore, Rashi has to say something similar to that which was suggested before, which is that the opening up of the earth and death are not necessarily connected because something else can happen. The earth can open up, Korach's sons can fall down, but because they repented, they could be protected. And this is what the Talmud says. Rashi is quoting the Talmud, and this is what the Talmud says. What is the meaning of that which is written? <laughs> but if the Lord creates a new creation and the earth opens its mouth, Moses said before God, if Gehenna, Right, what we might call in Hebrew, Gehenna. Does that need a translation? No. Gehenna. We use it in Yiddish too. We use it in Yiddish. All. Okay. So if Gehenna is already created, good. But if not, God should create it now. Why was Moses asking for Gehenna to be created? If we say that his request was God to actually create Gehenna, but isn't it written that there's nothing new under the sun? There are no new creations after the six days of creation. So therefore, how could Moses ask God to create Gehenna? Rather, he wasn't asking to create Gehenna, but to bring the opening of Gehenna close to there, so that the assembly of Korach would be buried alive. When, with regards to the verse, and the sons of Korach didn't die, it's taught. In the name of our teacher, the sages said, a place was fortified for them in Gehenna, and they sat upon it and recited songs of praise. Right? That's what Korach's sons, they were punished for being Korach's sons, but they were still righteous. Rabbi Barbar Khanna says, one time I was walking, on, that's the end of the teaching, and here's a little anecdote to support the teaching. One time I was walking on the path and a certain Arab said to me, come and I will show you those from the assembly of Korach who were swallowed. I went and I saw two fissures in the ground from which smoke was emerging. That Arab took a woolen fleece and dampened it with water and placed it on the tip of his spear and passed it over the fissures there. The fleece was singed, indicating the level of heat there. He said to me, listen, what do you, so he wanted to show how hot that, that uh, the fissure in the ground was. He says, what do you hear? And I heard this, that they, what were they saying? And in Hebrew, what were they saying? Saying, Moshe the Torah to emet. Vehain Bada'im. They were saying Moses and his Torah are true, and they are liars. I mean, we are liars. That's what they were repenting. That Korach sons were sitting there in Gehenna, burning in Gehenna, saying, Moshe the Torah so emes, Moshe and his Torah are true, but we, we're the fakers, we're the liars. And then the Arab said to him, Every 30 days, Gehenna returns them to this place like meat cooking in a cauldron. And they say this, Moses and his Torah are true, and they, meaning we, are liars. End of the story. That's the Midrash. What do you think? Wow, what a tale. Yes. Yes. It's an extraordinary tale. What happened to Korach's sons? They didn't die. But did they get swallowed up? You better believe they did, says the Gemara. Absolutely. So did they die or didn't they die? It depends who you ask. <laughs> <laughs> it depends who you, the question is, uh, you know, interestingly, we have traditions that others didn't die, like Elijah the prophet and so on. That, that's not what, even though the Torah says they didn't die, we know that they died. The question is, were they killed as part of, as part of the plague? Okay. And I have another question. Yeah, please. If God was 
forgiving enough because they've, they've repented mm -hmm. to allow Korach and his sons not to die. Why wasn't there a, ch a chance for the average guy in the, in the group to have that opportunity too? Maybe they had some repentance in their, in their hearts and nothing was said about that. Yeah, it's a good, that's a, a great question. You know, was there anybody else in this, in this category as well? I, I don't know. I don't know. We're only told about Korach's children because of, uh, because of that, that genealogy that they're kind of thrown, thrown in there, but, but we don't know about it. It could be, could be that they have company in there in that very hot place. But in the text, in uh, verse 22, uh, there's another incident when uh, Moses saved another group of people because God wanted the, to uh, wipe them out as well. And Moses interceded. In chapter 16, verse 22? Yes, yes. yes. And so it reminds you, of course, uh, of Abraham... Uh, Indra, was it Abraham or Noah? What? Anyway, uh, <laughs> with um, the city of uh, Sodom. Yeah, so, and, and the Midrashim will, will often compare Abraham and Noah and say, you know, be more like Abraham, be more like Moses, who will stand up for other people, right? There, there's a progression of this. So you have Noah who stands up for no one. God says, I'm going to bring a flood. Noah says, okay, where do I build my boat? Tell me how to build my boat. That's it. Noah mm -hmm. stands up for no one. Abraham stands up for his family. Abraham has his nephew Lot. He advocates for Lot. He stands up for his family. Moses stands up for the stranger. Moses, the Egyptian, stands up for the Israelite, or the Egyptian royalty stands up for the Israelite who is being, who is being tortured. So you have an evolution of caring about the other um, that, that, that progresses from there. Yeah. Whoa, but Noah's family goes with him in the boat, just like uh, Abe standing up for Abraham yeah. standing up for his family. But Noah's family, because that we wouldn't have had all the disaster after the flood was over, what his son did. Yeah, yeah, a hundred percent. But but Abraham at least advocates for the rest of the city, and not okay. just his family. That's true. He, he at least he says, okay, my you know the city in which my family lives should be should be spared. So there's a, a fascinating comment. Um, Rabbi, I wanted, oh, can I yeah, just go, ask a question? You talk about every 30 days. So what happened in between those 30 days? Uh, you know, uh, I, I don't know the answer to that question. It seems to be the way it's presented that this place of Gehenna is this traveling, I don't know, it travels from place to place. It, it exists on a different sphere of physics than, than, than we're familiar with. And so Gehenna can be multiple places. But basically, if you go to this little crack in the ground, and look down for 29 days of the month, you will see nothing. And for one day, you will see people burning up and they're singing songs of praise. Oh, I, I, because there's, a, just as a, a tangent, you know, there's a Greek and mythology that, you know, I don't know, I think Zeus, somebody um, wanted to marry Zeus's daughter or whatever, and then Zeus found out and then he was, um, he was hung and, and he was, and every day the crows came and ate his liver and then it, it, you know, it regrew and that's the only organ that regrows. And that's the story of like, I don't know if you know that story, but anyways, it's from Greek mythology. So it just reminded me of that same thing yeah. that every 30 days, it comes back to be the same thing. So yeah, there's a, um, that's Prometheus. Prometheus, Prometheus. Yeah. Pr Prometheus and the, and, and the liver. And actually uh, right. recently, a few months ago, I was at the uh, Philadelphia Museum of, of Art, and there's a, uh, there is a beautiful portrait. I'm, I'm blanking on who it was, but of Prometheus and the crows pecking away at his liver. Mm. Um, Thanks. Okay. Rabbi, I also yeah. have a question. It concerns the fact that we have psalms that are attributed to Korach's sons. Great. We're going to get to that right now. Oh, okay. Excellent. So, so you know, we're left with a lot of questions here, including one question of, you know, they're singing this song. What, what are we talking about? We're singing this song. So look at the Chidush Agadot, which is uh, early 16th century, uh, early 16th century, um, uh, the Maharsha. He wrote, Bnei Korach Lometu, Lamdu Lomar Kane. Okay. Um, 
He says, okay, so the question is, even though, according to those who say that Korach didn't die himself, his children are most certainly included within the category of all of Korach's people, all of his people. They too were, were absorbed or were swallowed up by the earth. But after they had repentance in their hearts, they had a high place in Gehenna, and presumably the high place of the in Gehenna, it's the opposite of the way things work here on earth. That we're here on earth, heat rises. In Gehenna, the hottest places are the places that were closer to the ground. And so um, after uh, they, they were at the highest places of, of in Gehenna, um, the Ashvusham Kaperish Rashi Bachumash, that's what Rashi says in the Chumash. The Sha'amu Shira. What did they say when they were uh, when they were reciting a song? They were reciting Psalm 88, right? So you know this tradition that King David wrote psalms, right? That's a, a very common tradition. The Talmud mentions it. But there are other traditions that many of the psalms were actually written previous or prior to King David by other people. Maybe King David was repeating these traditions, or maybe that the psalms is a collection of traditions of those that were written by King David and those that were written by others. And Psalm 88, which we'll look at the first few verses in a moment, what is called Shir Mizmor Livne Korach. It's called the Psalm of the Korachites, of the children of Korachites. So look at, um, just look for a moment at, at, at the Psalm. We'll just look at a few verses. Shir Mizmor Livne Korach, a Psalm of the Korachites for the Lamnatseach, for the conductor. Al machalat la'anot, and this word, these words are very elegantly translated as machalat la'anot. They're not translated as all because at all because we're not certain as to what these words mean. But what is machala? Uh, sometimes Lager. thickness. What's that? Machala in, in, in modern Hebrew, you're sick, but it could be also maybe as severe as a plague. I don't know. Good. So a, a plague, a sickness, a machala. Good. It comes the Hebrew word chole. It also can come from the word machol, which means a dance or a circle or circle dance. Okay, we'll get back to that in a moment. Maskil, leheman has rachi. All this is like an introductory verse or introductory phrase using a lot of different words or using three different words for, uh, for song. Shir, mizmor, maskil, all different words for song in Tehillim. Okay. And he says here, um, the Gimel uh, Shir, Shir Mizmor Lamnatseach. They use three different words for song. Neged, why three different words? Neged Shlosha Bene Korach, the three children of Korach. The Al Machalat. And when it says this word Machalat, it's referring to the Hebrew word Machal. You know the word Machal? Limchol Mechila. Oh, to be like on Yom Kippur. Exactly. Forgiveness. That God forgave them. That God forgave them. So hidden in this, Shir is more like, oh, and it goes through, uh, it goes through a number of the other phrases that the whole concept is that they're singing from, I am at the brink of Sheol. I'm crying out to you. I am down, abandoned among the dead, like bodies lying in the grave of whom you are mindful no, no more. And are cut off from your care. You imagine B'nai Korach, Korach's children sitting there in Shaol, sitting there in Gehenna, crying out to God, God, remember me, God, save me. This is their song. According to the Talmud, according to the Maharsha, when they sang a song, this is the song that they wrote, that they sang, which is basically encapsulated in the words of the Talmud. They're singing, Moshe and his Torah are true. And we are liars, we are fakers, we have made mistakes. That's it. And I want to show you finally one interesting, uh, one interesting parallel is that, you know, we look together at the Talmud, at Talmud Bavli, Tractate Sanhedrin, page 110a. That's the source of this tradition. Right? Whenever you hear this tradition quoted, nine times, nine times out of 10, it's going to be from here. You hear the tradition that the children of Korach were sent down to Gehenna, where they live forever, crying out, Moshe and, and his Torah are right, and we are not. But there's another source in the Midrash Tanhuma. And the Midrash Tanhuma 
Look at the uh, the difference. The Midrash Tanchuma tells a similar story. We're going to uh, jump in halfway through. It's a similar beginning. It's all both in the name of Rava. They both quote the same sage, right? Nothing new under the sun. The sons of Korach did not die. It was taught in the name of our master. A place was set aside for them in Gehenna where they sat and uttered hymnody. Rabba Barba. So that, that's basically parallel, right? That's basically the same. Rabba Barbar Khanna said, so we have a, a you know, similar anecdote. One time it happened, we were traveling on the road when a certain Arab merchant said to me, come, I will show you the chasms of Korach. I went and saw two fissures out of which was coming smoke. He took a ball of clipped wool, steeped it in water, placed it on a spearhead, raised it over them, again, to show how hot it was, to show how it would be singed right away. And then he said, listen, what do you hear? And I actually heard them saying, Moses and his Torah represent truth. And they are liars, right? Again, the same thing. Moshe, the Torah, the Emet, the Hain, Bada'in. So in the world to come, the Holy One is going to take them. Ula atid lavo, hakadosh baruchu atid lahotziam. God will take them out of Gehenna. This is what, this line is what the Midrash adds that was not in the Talmud. The Midrash adds that line of salvation. And Cheryl, you're right to talk about Prometheus, because in the, in the version of the Talmud, they're suffering forever. They're sitting in Gehenna forever and ever and ever, crying out, saying, you were right, we were wrong. In the version of the Mishnah, of the, of the, um, of the Midrash, of the Tanhuma, that in the future, La'atid Lavo, presumably messianic times, God will remove them from Gehenna and restore them to a place of, of salvation. And this is not just an argument about what happened to the children of Korach. This is an argument about the fate of, of evil. Right? This is a fundamental argument about what happens in the afterlife, about how people are punished for their sins. Is there such a thing as eternal damnation? It seems from the Talmud and Tractate Sanhedrin, that's what happened to the children of Korach. Eternal damnation. According to the Tanhuma, according to the Med Midrash, no, that they suffer, they're punished, they cry out, they sing their song, they sing their psalm. But one day, one day God will take them out and God will save them. All of this from one verse that says, and the sons of Korach did not die. And are saying and are looking at that and scratching our heads and saying, wait a sec, sons of Korach didn't die, but it said that all of Korach's people died. And we have a number of different options as to how to resolve that. We can resolve it very simply by saying all of Korach's people did not include his family. His family were not punished at all. Or we could look at it as the Talmud does and say, no, no, no. All of Korach's people includes his sons. They, they were swallowed up by the earth. But you know what? They didn't die. What happened to them? According to the Talmud Bavli tractate Sanhedrin, they sit there in Gehenna and sing forever and you can listen to them and hear them once every 30 days according to the medrash you can listen to them you can hear them but they're not going to be there forever catch them while you can catch this band singing while you can because they're going to be saved at a certain point and being brought back and 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 uh god will ultimately take them out take them out of Gehenna. any questions or comments on this I think fascinating teaching about the sons of Korach, the fate of the sons of Korach. It's interesting. It's interesting. I, I had a class in my bachelor's degree where we had to go for sections of Talmud and they'd send us into the National Library. And we had to look up all sorts of manuscripts of different versions of the Talmud. Hmm. Talmud and Shalmi, the Vatican, the one that's in the Vatican, a whole bunch. We had to write with different color pens. We used to have green, red, blue, whatever all the different variations and then come back to class and figure out if it in essence caused a difference in understanding. We never did it with halachic stuff. Hmm. The Talmud teacher never gave us halachic stuff to look up the variations, but this is the same kind of approach. Yeah, absolutely. 
Absolutely. You have multiple traditions in parallel with each other, and you can learn a lot about the different schools of thought by looking not for their similarities, but for their, their differences. But why wouldn't we, well, I'm just curious, why do you think the Talmud teacher was not comfortable in sending us to do any different variations with halachic stuff? Because, he, uh, uh, because we're obviously not going to change our halachic practice? I don't know, you know, but that's a, it's a core part of the study of halacha is looking for contradictions, looking for internal contradictions, looking, you know, this is how you study Maimonides. Maimonides is filled with contradictions. Yeah. And resolving Maimonides' contradictions are, is part of Talmud Torah. When Maimonides says something in, in, in the Guide to the Perplexed that, that explicitly contradicts the Mishnah Torah, Mishnah Torah. You, you have to learn and, and try to figure out why Maimonides changed his mind between point A or point B, or did he not change his mind? And, and can we resolve the contradiction in a different way? To prove that it's not a contradiction. That's yeah. part of the kind of the mental gymnastics yeah. that, that goes into Talmudic study. So I, I, I don't know about you know why the teacher would approach it that way. Um, but uh, I'm just thinking of that real, now. Real just part sort of, of halacha yeah. is, is looking, searching out those contradictions, in particular the internal contradictions when one person contradicts themselves. But but the thing is, is that if you have a Talmud section that you then derive your halachic practice. And the teacher sends you, and you find different manuscripts that are equally, um, I don't know what, to, he would only send us to manuscripts that he wanted us to use. Mm. It never, you did not go, you went A, B, but you did not, you didn't, there was never any kind of change by the, you know, the Chachamim right. of the time to change our practice as a result. Right. Okay, right. sorry, it's a side, no, side no, thing, no, but I just found this. That's great. Thank you. Yeah, Peter. Um, I'm having trouble understanding the whole issue of the uh, Arab asking or saying to somebody, come and listen to this particular song. I don't know why it's relevant. Hmm. If in the last explanation, the concept that uh, when the Messiah comes, uh, Korach's children will be brought back up to uh, a positive life. Um, that's totally independent of the uh, of the metaphor that they're trying to to uh, uh, introduce, and frankly, it lessens the credibility of the idea of the Messiah because it's implausible at best that someone that's been follow, swallowed up in a, uh, a landslide or whatever uh, with geothermal uh, energy boiling up through the earth, through all of that, you're going to listen to somebody singing a song. It seems to me improbable and most important not necessary <laughs> uh points well taken um firstly the the literary structure is i think pretty clear is oftentimes we'll have a tradition and then we'll have somebody else jump in and say and i saw it with my own eyes a right. later a later sage so that that's fine we that's what rabba barbar khana is doing we have a tradition that Korach's sons were swallowed up and but kept in a high place in Gehenna and, and whatever. And Rabbi Baruchana says, actually, it's true. I saw them with my own eyes and I heard them. Um, you know, as to the, the deeper function and the philosophical function and what point it's trying to make and clearly suspending all of our understandings of science and reality and geology and whatever it is, uh, you know, any, any, uh, any field of study is... is, is uh, is going to contradict uh, or, or going to oppose this tradition. Um, I don't think that's what it's meant to do. I don't think we're meant to actually, you know, Im imagine with such clarity Korach sons standing there surrounded by fire, singing the same psalm over and over and over again. I think even without the, the fire, saying the same psalm over and over and over again would be a punishment. Um, or, or, and I think even not only the same psalm, but saying you were right, I was wrong over and over and over again 
is is a punishment. I think there are the larger issues of the interpersonal, of uh, of the ideas of reward and punishment, and to the degree that we can understand it, we we will. I, I don't know that this was ever meant to be taken as a real, you know, that this actually happened. Um, I'm not sure um, to that degree that that we are to imagine that there is a place known to certain locals. That's what the Arab merchant is. He's a local. Right. No, known only to the locals that they can find this hidden fissure in the ground. There are fissures all over. You could look around, you could spend your whole life anytime you see a crack in the ground, putting your ear to the ground, listening for Psalm 88 to be recited underground. Um, Rabbi, do you know yeah. how Maimonides interpreted this? I, I have a feeling it would be a very different interpretation. Yeah, 100%. Yeah, Maimonides, it's allegory. It's all allegory. Yeah. There, there's nothing real, nothing real to any of this. It's uh, yeah. It has I to think pass that's a scientific more, test. Yeah, I think Peter, that might be the better way to look at it. I mean, if it's meant to confuse us, if it's meant to make us ask questions and keep us studying, then it's working. It's interesting. <laughs> I think it's interesting, and I think the role of midrash, and for me, the fascinating part is that we all started. This all started with a verse. This all started with a you know, if if you or I were just sitting and reading the Torah and came across the line and children's sons didn't die, we would just say, okay, so, so Korach's sons didn't die. Okay, big deal. All right. But when the rabbis read this and when the sages of the Midrash and the Talmud read this, they said, what, what are you talking about? They didn't die. But didn't everybody perish? Ah, they perished, but they didn't die. They were swallowed up, but they didn't die. We have, we have a way of answering this, using our creativity, bringing in the ideas of reward and punishment, bringing in, according to the Midrash, the idea of salvation and, and repentance and the power of repentance. There's so much here that we can extract out of this little textual challenge. Um, and, and that's amazing. I, I, I get excited by that. So anyway. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Esther, last comment we have to... Uh, we have to uh, this question that keeps coming. There's a line that says, as all men do, in that little part that we read, that everybody dies, as all men do. Yeah. Well, but they may not have just died then, but they're going to die sometime because nobody doesn't die. There's no one that stays alive forever. And maybe right. that's one of the points. So that, yeah, that was one of the points. That's when, when you know, when they said, if they, if, if all of Korach's people, if the whole rebellion, if they die a natural death, then they were right because that's a sign that God's not angry at them. But if something unnatural happens, like the earth swallows them up, that's proof that they were wrong. That's in, that's in the Torah itself. Uh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. That's, uh, you know, it's an interesting thought that a natural death is a blessing, right? And, and, and in a certain way, we know that, you know, yeah. we know that visiting, uh, visiting Poland and going to the cemeteries in Warsaw the cemeteries all over Poland and thinking these were the lucky people. And you know that looking at you know, the people who were fortunate to have family around and a burial and all the things that we associate with the natural end of life and, mm -hmm. and not the unnatural way of that, that so many have tragically perished. And that's what Moshe is saying to Korach and the, and, and the, the rebels as well. If a natural death happens, then you're right. But if not, then I'm right. So. Okay, we'll, uh, we'll close with that. Thank you all for, uh, for joining us, not only today, but throughout. Stay tuned for more Torah, for more learning, and uh, can't wait to tackle our third, now what will be our third cycle of Parsha Insights uh, towards the end, of, the end of the summer. But between now and then, have a wonderful, wonderful summer, a wonderful break. Continue to learn the Parsha. I will as well. And uh, hopefully we can trade notes when we come back together. Have a rabbi. Thank you. Thank you. Everybody Thank you, rabbi. do well. Are you going to get to go away during?